Hey, 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 we are so glad to be with our friend, our sister, uh, the woman of God, teacher Aprella, as she leads us today. Uh, we are continuing our study on what can stunt the life of a Christian, and we don't want our growth to be stunted ever. So we're so grateful to you to be with us today. Teacher Prella. we know that you have lots of other challenges to do and lots of other teachings to do, but we thank God for you to take time out of your schedule today to be with us, uh, to lend us a word. And we know that you are always relevant, always amazing. And so we uh, just thank God for you. So we're going to go on as those of you who are online. Thank you guys for being here on Facebook today. Uh, I hope that before we get started and before she prays that if you all are uh, joining this uh, broadcast that you all will send some love hearts to her. I'm sure she would be encouraged by that. And then you can get some comments and you can put some things and put some hearts in there. Those of you here on Zoom, you all can do the same and let her know that she's loved and that you're praying for her so that she can uh, teach well, teach with power, teach with anointing. And those of you on uh, Facebook, feel free to share this to your timeline so that we can uh, bless other people who may need this important word. So I'm going to, uh, without delay, I'm going to come off of here and I'm going to let the woman of God speak. And uh, you go forth, woman of God, as you pray for us and as you go forth. Hey, midday. Thank you for having me, Reverend Yvette. Um, and I don't want to delay the time. Today, we're talking about adding a rules to scripture. But before I start, I got to go to the throne of grace. Um, have your Bibles ready because we're going to kind of go a lot of different places today and hopefully you can keep up and follow me. Uh, this is what I believe that the Holy Spirit gave for us. Um, so just go with me. You may agree, you may not agree. I'm just following what the word of God says. Um, so Father, you are faithful and you are true God. Lord, um, I pray right now, God, that you will use me, Lord, as a vessel, oh God, to... Uh, Speak your word, God, as you would have it delivered to your people, God. Prick our hearts, God. Mm. Lord, help us to understand the damage that we do when we add to your word, when we add rules and when we do the things um, that, that we hurt others. Help us, Lord, to help me, God, to just say what you that needs to be said, God. You get all the glory. Lord, you do the work. I'm just a vessel. Um, use me for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So today we're going to be work talking about adding of rules to scripture. Um, I, I selected several verses so you can go with me. Um, the first verse I had was every work, uh, Proverbs 35 through 6, every work of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. But it goes on to say, do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. So I started with this particular scripture. Um, but when I saw the topic and I, I spoke to Reverend Yvette and confirmed the direction of this lesson, I was not certain which way to go. So go with me. <laughs> an old song came to me when given the opportunity to share this topic um, and you may or may not have heard it it's called uh, In the Church and the chorus is it shouldn't be in the church I initially thought this was a song that was written and performed by Shirley Caesar to find out later it was written by Angie Spivey the lyrics tell us what should and should not be in the church she runs a list of things that shouldn't be in a church, backbiting, gossiping, fighting, hatred, and many others. She also lists the things that should be in the church, love, joy, peace, salvation, victory. And then the chorus is, my house shall be the house of prayer. I couldn't get the song out of my head. So I really believe the Holy Spirit was leading me to incorporate it into this lesson. Mind you, I really didn't know how. I couldn't figure out how it would fit. 
However, in my discussions with my co-teachers, because I'm still trying to figure out where am I going with this lesson? I needed some ideas. Okay, so in my discussion, uh, forgive me. In my discussion with them, I asked for advice on their thoughts because I'm trying to narrow this topic down. Uh, the one thing that we did discuss were the rules that we expect unbelievers to follow. Think about this. Um, remember, the name of the, the, the subject is adding of rules to scripture. And I'm, I'm talking about we're going two kind of two ways, okay? Uh, dealing with the believer and the unbeliever. Okay, um, why do we have an expectation? Let me say it, let me say it a different way. We expect something that is not possible for someone who does not know God. What do I mean by that? We have a holy expectation of an unholy people. The only people who are called to be holy are the people of God. Be holy for I am holy. This does not apply to those who know not God. They follow the rules, who's talking about rules again, of the flesh and of the world and of their father, the devil. We expect people to understand the people of God, the, the church people. When, we, when First and foremost, as the church, a lot of times we are not looking a lot. We, we look like the world and not the church. We don't look different. And I know this is like a hard lesson. So, um, but we have a lot of expectations. We put a lot of rules on people. First uh, Corinthians 2, 14 says, but a natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, but they are foolishness to him and cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. That means they don't understand. The unbelievers worldview is in stark contrast to that of the church. However, the bigger problem is the fact that the church is not attractive. What do I mean? Because you know what? I'm a part of that church. I'm a part of the body of Christ. And I'm not saying Jesus is not attractive, but what is going on here? It does. And the problem is we as the body of Christ, a lot of times we don't show the love of our Lord and Savior to those who need him. How, and I'm just asking some questions, throwing some things out here. How can we draw the unbeliever into the church without the love of Christ? Think about it. How were we drawn to Christ? Was it the rules of the church or the love of God? Okay. According to scripture, Jeremiah 31, 3 says, yes. What did he say? I have loved you with an everlasting what? Love. Therefore, with love and kindness have I drawn you. I said nothing about I have drawn you with rules. This is me. Love is the foundation of the church. John 3, 16. What does it say? For John so loved the world that he gave the Holy God the Son, that whosoever believes in him shall be what? Saved. It is the love of Christ that draws, draws, not the rules. Now, let me be clear. Rules are necessary to govern people, and without them, there is chaos. So my next point is, what is a rule? A rule is a prescribed guide for conduct or action, an accepted custom or habit, a legal precept or doctrine, a regulation or bylaw, governing procedure or controlling principles. Um, and when we look at, when we think about rules, we think about safety, lawmakers, written rules, penalties, environment policies that we enforce. Webster defines a rule as something that is prescribed as listed. The purpose is to, A, control the conduct of others by prescribing precepts and customs. It is designed to create a habit or action that is continuous to keep order and avoid chaos. Again, rules are needed. However, they are designed to control and or govern. The problem is everyone wants to be gov the governing authority. <laughs> everyone wants to be in control where the reality is only God is in control and we are limited. Now, yes, he has given us dominion, but again, he alone, uh, he alone uh, is God in the ultimate governing authority. In scripture, there are several definitions for the word rule 
and all are associated with control, dominion, having rule over or mastery. As we have seen throughout church history, we have uh, scripture has been used to control people. We have recently seen it used to do what? Substantiate the horrible behaviors of the GOP. We have seen it used to justify slavery, so on and so forth, thus causing confusion, condemnation of people, period. As the body of Christ, we have to be reflective of our Savior. Let me say it again. As a body of Christ, we ought to be reflective of our Savior, Jesus. As a believer, we are governed by this book, the Word of God. But when I look at the Word, when you see the Word of God, how do you view this book? How does the world view this book? How does the body of Christ view this book? Is it a book of rules and do's and don'ts, or is it God's love letter? Um, unfortunately, the believer and unbeliever see the word as a book of rules and not a love letter. Again, the Bible tells us in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. The whole purpose of scripture is to show the love of God to a dying world. So what does the scripture say? There are a couple of uh, scriptures I just want to go through, and I'm going to go really fast, and then we're going to keep going. So 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us what all scripture is what breathed out by God, all of it, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training, and righteousness that the man of God may be complete, put it for every good work. And I already told you about Proverbs 35 through 6, but I'll say it again. Every work of God, what proves true, he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. But it also tells us, do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and be found a liar. Psalm 119, 19 says, forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. And Matthew 24, 24, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. All scripture is breathed by God. Every work of God proves true, and we are not to add to his word. Do you know his words are firmly fixed in heaven? Do you know his, why, why this is important? Adding to God's word is so dangerous because it does so much damage. Not only does it do damage within the body of Christ, it does damage to those who are looking for the Savior, okay? It is a distraction away from God, okay? Uh, it leads people astray and does not draw them to himself. Instead of drawing people to Christ, we are leading them astray when we add things. Let me give you some clear examples of rules that have kept people away from the church or out of the church because of the rules that a man made. Um, and these are just some, some uh, old stuff, but it's still, it's still something that causes a problem. I think as the body, uh, the body of Christ, a lot of us have grown and we've, uh, we're not as stringent with some of these things, but they still exist. Women wearing dresses in churches and men wearing hats and earrings in buildings. I remember... Uh, uh, wearing makeup and jewelry. I went to a, a church, I think it was a holiness church, and they was, and I had on red lipstick, y'all, and cute earrings. Y'all know I like my makeup. And basically, they probably, they told me, yeah, I had a Jezebel <laughs> So I never went back. Uh, my daughter is pregnant. I like rap music. My son is gay. They, a lot of people use these to tell people that they're not safe. I can't chew gum on Sundays. I don't dance or drink. I love to dance. I don't drink, but I love to dance, okay? Ignoring some sins and allowing others. You know what those are. Women not allowed to speak in the church. Ooh. Well, here we are. It's a whole bunch of women on this call. <laughs> and this group is led by a powerful woman of God. So we already know. These are some of the rules that have been implemented in the church, turning many away. Let me tell you a quick story. Over the years, I have encouraged many of my family to attend church. Um, 
I had a cousin, I had a cousin, let me say that, this very dear to me and close to my heart. Um, she was about 12 at the time. And she was really, really seeking God and looking to get saved. And she wanted to go to church. Well, she always went to church. Uh, the history of my family, half was Catholic and the other half is uh, uh, Protestant, Christian or whatever. But she always attended a Catholic church. Uh, and long before there was a Salem Baptist Church in Chicago, we had the Catholic church who allowed you to wear whatever you wanted to wear to church. So she wore pants all the time. Um, and she didn't own a dress, but she wanted to go to church with me. So we found an outfit in her closet that was nice and flowy. It wasn't a dress. It was some pants and a top, but it was nice. Nice enough to, to go in and very presentable and everything for church. Okay. We got to the door, we got in the church, and guess what happened? We were greeted by a nice, a not so nice, a very rude usher, and uh, was very mean and nasty to her. And mind you, I knew what the rules were, okay, uh, about wearing pants in the church, but I thought it was more important, her salvation, her hearing the word was more important than what she had on, on the outside. But as a result of the usher and the nastiness and the rudeness because of her attire, and mind you, she didn't have a dress up to the to, to the Y2C or any of that. She had on, she was properly clothed, okay? But as a result, she's almost 50 years old. She First off, her response was, I will never, ever, ever, ever go back in a church like that again. And here we are now, uh, what, 30 some years later, and she's, still, she's finally easing back in. But just think about that. How many people have been turned away? Okay, and again, that's old school, but that's man-made rules. Those are rules that we have implemented, okay? They have turned people away, okay? So, this severely impacted her view of the church and quote unquote church people. She said she would never go back, okay? But my question is, was it worth it to implement such rules to the point that we, and, and whatever these rules are, not just pants or anything like that, but we ostracize and we alienate unbelievers and believers as well, because that same church, I used to feel uncomfortable because I, at that time, I was a young single mother. I didn't have, uh, for those of y'all who know me, you know, I like to dress and things like that, but I didn't have the things then. And I would, you know, and I wore, I, re, I did a lot of repeats. I still do a lot of repeats, but you know, people make you feel uncomfortable and not want to come to church because of simple things like that. Furthermore, what are we doing to those who are in, I mean, why are we doing this to the people that are in the church? So example, she was an unbeliever and I'm a believer. I just gave you two clear examples. I didn't even want to go to church because of it. And then she's like, I don't even want to know Jesus because of it. And then the question is, where's the love? Where's the grace? Think about it. But what happens is we, we get into this thing called legalism, okay? Because when we, we start implementing man-made rules and we start uh, adding to God's word and not doing and, and, and making it more difficult, okay, we border over into legalism. Legalism attempts to obtain and secure God's righteousness by merit. Basically, salvation by works and not by grace. If I do this, then I can gain the favor of God. Now, this is dangerous because now I have become like the Pharisee. Do you know after the Ten Commandments was given, there were over 600 additional rules added oppressing the people? Um, and, and I'm not saying everybody in the body of Christ is doing this, but we just have to be careful. We, we have become legalists and not extenders of God's grace. What do I mean? 
okay? Let us give the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? Because guess what? When we start adding rules, okay, uh, the, the message becomes convoluted. And then we're, 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 we have these, we're teaching people, oh, if you don't do this, then God's not going to love you. And if you don't do that, that's not true. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man what may boast. The law is God's righteous requirement, and we could even fulfill it. It is our faith in God alone that secures our salvation. It is not our works, but his finished work on the cross. He is the fulfillment of the law that we could never obtain without him. Yet we place these rules on the body of Christ, turning people away from him. Again, let me be clear. Rules are necessary. But true believers love the Savior. And because of our love for God, we desire to please him. It's like anything else. Uh, or any other reason, uh, I, I don't want to minimize the relationship with God, but I want to use an example. When I love someone, I love them. I love them. I love them. You don't have to put a rule on me to tell me how not to hurt them, how not to, uh, I want to do the thing that pleases them because I want to show them how much I love. Them. So when I show them, and I show them how much I love them, because a lot of things that I do, I don't do it to get brownie points, to earn those points, okay? The reality is, you know, we think that God needs our help in saving people. We really believe that we need to implement additional laws to the scripture to keep people in line. We don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. That grace that God gives us, a lot of people are like, oh, gosh, if you teach grace, oh, this gives people license to sin. I'm going to tell you, what does the Bible say? The Bible tell us, if you God, Jesus says, if you love me, you're going to keep my command. Because when he saves us, when he saves us, he showed us how great a love that he has for us. And when we really get in, in our hearts how much he loves us, we want to please him. We want to do those things. It comes, it comes as a part of that. He helps us to do that. We don't, we don't have to do that for him. Okay? Um, I'm thinking. We, uh, therefore, we impose these rules on people, pushing them away from God. That's not what we want to do. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who does the convicting. Our God, our job, I'm sorry, is to preach the gospel. The word will do the work. We got to allow the word to do the work. We keep his commands because we love him. Okay? Uh, however, even in keeping his commandments, you know what? You can't do it. I can't do it apart from him. He is the one who enables us through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Apart from Jesus, we can't do anything. Galatians 2.21, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if the righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. He did it all, everybody. We don't have to add anything. The goal is to, uh, to love as Christ loved. When we add rules, it's damaging, it's destructive, it's deadly. Do you realize when we impose our own man-made law rules in the church, we are damaging our brothers and sisters? People don't want to come to church because of all the rules. They fear what others think about them because someone knows about their past. But remember, you had a past too, okay? Instead of loving them, we we judge them and we criticize them based on their past but again we had one too but i thank god for the sea of forgetfulness okay but do we have we forgotten what god has done for us people become hurt church hurt people go away from god god is trying to draw us and attract us to him okay <laughs> You know, they leave and miss out on the word of God because of what man thinks. 
And then we confuse and unsure about our salvation, about where we stand with God, because then we start imposing all these rules. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to do the work in each individual lives. We teach the gospel, we preach the gospel. The Holy Spirit that indwells us will convict us. The Holy Spirit that indwells us. And as we study this word, our minds and our lives will be conformed to the image. That's what he's doing. It's not our job to conform anyone to the image of Christ. Our job is to tell the world about a loving Savior, to tell the people in the church that God loves them even when they mess up. Okay? Um, no, the people imposing these rules um, don't even attempt to help help the people. Uh, Matthew 24, 23, 1 through 4, uh, then Jesus said to the crowd and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but the works they do, for they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear. Do you know that's what we do when we we put these burdens on people. I come to the church not to be burdened, but to cast my cares on him for he cares for me. He cares for you. He cares for the world, for God so loved the world. Okay? But we do this. We, we, we put these burdens on people. I, what's the point? If I'm going to be burdened and heavy laden. Okay? People come to church for relief from this burden and not to be weighed down with more rules and regulations. They, the, the, the salvation, Christ gave us freedom in him and to live. Jesus, he did all that for us. Jesus is our burden bearer, our heavy load sharer. He did all the heavy lifting so that we don't have to. Our job is to tell people, God requires faith alone in Jesus. Why? Because Jesus did it. He paid it all. The burden of and weight of sin. Do you know what it did to him? It crushed him. He willingly laid down his life for us. He willingly carried the burden of our sin. He willingly took our place on the cross. Where would we be without Jesus meeting us right where we were? and picking us up out of the muck and mire of our sin. And then what did he do? He cleansed us off everybody. And he purified our hearts. And then he loved us so that we are presented faultless before the Father. He loves us so much. Um, so that's why it's necessary that we handle the people, the body, our sisters and brothers would care. These are the precious people of God. Furthermore, we need to love as Christ loves us. We need to be loving and kind, okay? It is not just about us in the church, but those outside the body of Christ. I told you in the beginning, Jesus' goal is to seek and to save the lost. Where is the love, not the rules? Where is the grace? How can we lead people to Christ without loving like Christ? I'm not talking about loving like the world. The world have a, has a new definition of what love is. Love who you love, how you love, you can't help who you love. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Loving like Christ meets people where they are. Loving them despite their sin their situation, and those things that you and I don't agree about. Loving them doesn't mean I agree with your sin. I love like Christ, not the world. I, the goal is to lead them to the Savior. The path I take is the love of the Savior. 1 John 4, 17, 4, 7, um, beloved, let us, love one another for love is from God and whoever has uh whoever loves has been born of God and knows God anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love 
In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son. Why? I told you in the beginning, for God so loved the world that we might live through him. It's not the goal of uh, for, for any to perish, but to all to come to repentance. So we, want, we don't want to hurt the people in the church, and we want to draw those that don't know him to him because he loves each of us so much, okay? Um, don't worry about whether or not they will follow the rules. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandment. The obedience will come as they walk with and love the Lord. Again, it's all about the love, not loving the way of the world, but the way of Christ and God so love the world. Remember, this is a process, you know what is called sanctification. We all sin daily, but thank God for the throne of grace. Thank God for the blood of Jesus uh, that is continually cleansing us. Thank God for it is his, with his loving kindness, his loving kindness, y'all. Think about that, that he has drawn us. Stop adding the rules. Stop adding the scriptures. Stop placing burdens on people. Stop trying to control others by the rules that you and I think I needed to keep them in line. Believe me, God knows exactly what we need and, and how to keep us on track. He does not need our help. I'm going to end this lesson with 1 Corinthians. Um, he says, if I, uh, chapter 13, 1 through 7, he says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a what a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers that understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am what? Nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be fine, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is what? It's patient. Love is patient. Love is patient. And love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. I believe when we add to scripture, we are insisting on the way we think it's supposed to go and not what God says. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I started this lesson by stating what should or shouldn't be in the church. And I, that song by Angie Spivy, but I'll end it with an old song by Roberta Flack and Donnie Hathaway. Where is the love? Where is the love? What should be in the church? The love of God. How do we show people Jesus? By showing him how much he loves us. Stop making a whole lot of rules and let us try loving all those who you encounter with the love of Christ. Let them see Jesus that indwells you and I. That's the end of our lesson today. Father, you are so good and you are so kind and there is none mm, like you. If it wasn't for your love, where would each of us be? If it wasn't for your love and kindness, goodness gracious, the thought of being separated from you is just awful. And it's a whole world who doesn't know you. And there's a bunch of people in the church that are hurting because we think we know better than you. But God, let this message do only what you would have to do. I, I can't even, I don't even know how to pray about it, but I just know God that you are in control. I know, Lord, um, you love us with, there's no greater love. I don't even know how you love us like you love us, but God, I just thank you. Lord, help us to love the lost and help us to love each other as you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I can't hear you, Reverend. You 
mm. love, give some love. Those of you on Facebook, those of you on Zoom, come on and give some love, give some love. We just want to thank God for the vessel, for the vessel, amen, for the vessel. Amen. Those of you who are on Facebook now, we're about to go into our chat. We're about to go into our discussion time. You have time Mm, to still come on Mm, and to join us in that space. In the meantime, we pray if you have not received Jesus Christ, you already heard the invitation today. You have a chance to receive him today. If you've been hurt, if you've been uh, broken, if there's been something that has caused you to break away from the body of Christ because of something that someone has said to you, you have broken your heart who has tried to to keep you off your square with things that were not in the scripture, then first of all, we want to apologize on the scripture's behalf and say that we are sorry that someone had said something to you that was not in line with scripture. And we want you to give God an opportunity to redeem that you you in this time so as we close this we want to just pray for you as she has prayed we will continue to pray for you feel free to join yes. us into this time and we hope that you have an amazing day if you know that this is a lesson that can be a blessing to someone else share it to your timeline and god bless you and we hope that you will share with us next week as we continue this series on what can stunt the growth of a christian God bless you mm-hmm. and have an amazing, amazing day. I love you, Aprella. I love you. I love you too. Thank you.